Hello, Heart Revolution Church. We are so excited to be with you. I'm here with Pastor Hutchins from the Church of Champions here in Houston. Uh, I just first wanted to take a moment to uh, thank all the volunteers for this past Easter services. It was amazing. The kids had an incredible time. Souls got saved. Uh, the next week, many people were baptized. So we're just so excited. We also uh, kicked off a series called Anxious for Nothing. Anxious for Nothing. And um, we, we got that series out of the scripture in uh, Philippians 4. I'm going to read it to you real quick, and then we're going to have a discussion. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, all understanding. will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we're excited because... Um, Actually, in Houston, we're, we're doing the same series, Anxious for Nothing, so we're on the same pathway of uh, ministering to the people. So how did it go Sunday? I, I thought we had a phenomenal uh, re response to the word that was being spoken. And, of course, we, uh, we saw so many people uh, come to uh, fellowship the peace of God in a different, in a new way. In a, in a season of anxiety where everyone has been touched by it, everyone can, uh, can certainly understand what it means to be anxious. Uh, in all of the uncertainties of life, more people now are, uh, are anxious than they've ever been before. And so I've had so many people tell me, I needed that, you spoke to me, it was, it was you, you spoke just to me, it, it, it was for me. And, and so we had so many people that just felt like they had a breakthrough of understanding. You, uh, you were talking about anxiety as it relates to what ifs. What were you saying about the Well, what Max, Lu Max Lucado said anxiety is the meteor shower of what ifs. Mm. Uh, that's a very powerful statement because uh, in this season, we know that anxiety has sharpened its edge and it's, it's a scythe and a sickle that is, that is reaping a harvest in every home. There's so many people under so much pressure and uh, when we're enveloped with uncertainty, Anxiety wants to sit upon the throne of our affections and it certainly rule over our heart. So, yeah, um, anxiety is always future focused. That's it. And so, we, we not only go into the future of what if this doesn't happen or what if this does happen. That's right. But a lot of times we'll travel in the past of what if I would have did something differently, would have that changed the outcome? And I say, if we look too much to our past, we experience depression. If we look too much to our future, right. we experience anxiety. That's right. Rather than just, just resting in the fact of That's who right. God is in this moment right, right now. Right. It's, it's the travails and the trials and the tribulations of our past that feeds our fears. Mm. But anxiety rules from our future. I, I said Sunday uh, to, our, to our people, uh, it's, anxiety wants us to believe that we are powerless against the ghouls of the unknown. And it's those ghouls who gobble up our futures, spoil our plans, terrorize our families, eat up our pets, and rob us of our rest. It's, it's the thing that, it's the what if. It's, it's not certain. It's filled, filled with anxiety and uncertainty. But it's what if. What if this happens? What if that takes place? What if that transpires? What if? And yeah. that comes from our future, not our past. Yeah. For me... Uh as I've struggled, I think everybody's struggled with some, some layer of anxiety. Absolutely. I, I've learned that um, to see life for the long run. Yes. Not the short haul. Process. And that life is not just an event. Right. It's, it's a journey. That's right. And so oftentimes you'll, you know, see somebody after you haven't seen them for some time and you'll say, uh, or we'll say, uh, how is life? And they'll start describing events. I got married. I had kids. This person died. And they live event to event. And in those events, if it's a good event, they're living, they're measuring their life by the event. That's right. Life must be good. That's right. That's if a standard a, of success. If it's a bad event, yeah. it must be bad. That's right. Rather than it's a journey of right. both good and bad. Right. And sometimes e events do happen, but right. they, they launch us into a journey 
of discovering God's yeah. grace. So you're talking about the, the, diff, the dichotomy between the East and the West mentalities. Mm -hmm. In the Western world, we are very compartmentalized because we run from event to event. Yeah. Uh, the, the calendar is filled with events. We move from successes to successes. We, we diminish the failures, we amplify the successes, and we're, we're programmed to believe that we're children of event oriented societies. Whereas in the East, in the Hebrew mind especially, you'll find people that, and, and certainly the Persians, you'll find people that are very much into the reality that they're building and working for something in their lifetime they'll never see transpire in their lifetime. They're always building for the future generation. They're always planting trees that will mature for their children. So uh, yeah, that's, that's very much process-centered uh, realities and, and especially theologies versus uh, spontaneous event-centered uh, excitement reality. The, and, and the issue, the issue with the event versus right. the process, right. is that you we start um, treating people on how we're feeling. That's right. So the way I've seen anxiety is there's uh, a thought, right, creates a pressure. I don't know how to escape. I don't know how to get out of That's it. That's right. And so. I try to create solutions. When I can't find the way out, That's right. I get ang angry. That's right. Because anger gives me a relief of anxiety. That's right. And then I go back to the anxiety wheel. That's right. Well, uh, that's good. So, you know, uh, a lot of people are like, I have an anger problem. No, not really. You have an anxiety problem. That's right. That's right. And your anger is trying to manage your anxiety. That's right. So it's a way of trying to find con control. That's right. That's and right. so what happens in relationship is we start punishing people because we don't believe in their process. Right. We judge them by their event. By their performance. By their performance. Yeah. There you go. So <clears throat> when you live in an event-centered uh, psychology and you're running from event to event, it becomes a narcotic mm. that feeds the hypersensitivity required uh, for self-performance, self-awareness, self-development, self right? Yeah. So you're running from one event to the next in the engineering of, of personal performance. Well, performance constructs self-righteousness and self-righteousness produces religious works. Wow. So you're living from, uh, you're living on this treadmill that is demanding more out of you to continue to be excellent so that you can meet the demands of the new, of the new event, wow. right? So that's what's so dangerous about trying to live um, from, from one mountain peak to the next yeah. and always doing everything you can to escape the valley, right? Yeah. The mountaintop is, is to give us that purview of revelation and to give us that moment of transfiguration, but it's in the valley that we mature. Wow. In the valley, we see our fractures, we see our failures, we meet our need, right? Yeah. And this is the perfect place for us to, to look at that because it's in the valley that we meet our anxieties. Yeah. It's in, the, it's in the pressure of this life that we're in, filled with uncertainties. We're in the valley. We cannot depend on a, an escape mechanism to get to the top of the mountain so that we can have a moment of transfiguration. Jesus said, while you're in the valley, don't fear, don't be anxious, and fret not. Mm, yeah. And we're, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to run out of our anxiety. and We don't, don't realize we're being ran by our anxiety. That's right. And that's the very thing causing us to be on the run. That's right. And so that's right. We're, we're in this cycle of trying to get away. And so what I what I've am discovering is that anxiety is something we all experience. That's right. And we can't get out of it ourselves. That's so right. what what is a better option is to invite Jesus into our anxiety. Oh, yes. Rather than trying to get out of it. Absolutely. Ourselves. You, you know, uh, in Proverbs 4:23. It says, above all else, guard your heart. It That's determines right. the course of your life. That's right. Philippians says the peace of God, it's going to pass our understanding. It's going to guard our heart and mind. That's right. In the Old Testament, it's be guarded, guard. That's right. That's right. But in the New Testament, it's be protected. That's right. And so you're living from a place of grace and law where it's, are you guarded in life, trying to protect yourself from the what ifs and the hurts? Are mm. you allowing God to protect your heart, your mind in this season from all the brokenness of the world. Oh my God, that's so good. And I'm reminded while you're speaking about the Old Testament versus the New Testament, yeah. uh, 
I'm, I'm reminded of the Passion Translation. David, in the 39th Psalm, he says these words, Fret not thyself, for it only leads you into lies. Mm. So anxiety can lead you. It's always going to lead you one direction. It's going to corrupt your future, and it's going to do so by leading you into a lie. Wow. And so this is where, this is where you're talking about the guardianship of the heart, right? Yeah. The guardianship of the heart in the Old Testament was you have to consecrate yourself and make sure that you're covered by the propitiation of the tabernacle. Yeah. In the New Testament, we have one who has come to guard our hearts by writing a new law on our hearts, oh. right? So he insulates us with an efficacious word of blood and spirit. <laughs> oh my God, I'm about to get happy. That's good. That's good. You know, we think uh, that, you know, when I, when I speak of anxiety, people think of the bad things that, right, right. that surround anxiety. You know, I'm anxious about a job. Right. I'm anxious about, uh, you know, a relationship. You right. know, all, all the big majors, a exactly. health issue. Exactly. But anxiety has a way of creeping in, even in the good things. Yes. So what I say is anxiety over bad things becomes fear. Yes. Anxiety in good things becomes striving. That's right. And so often, even in our American culture, we're praising people who are living and being driven by anxiousness and striving and performance. That's right. So you, the, the great businessman, he's, he's striving for the next deal, keeping the pipeline full. And we're like, he's successful. That's right. And is that success without contentment? That's right. Or is contentment? That's Success. right. That's right. Well, I have a dear friend of mine who is uh, extremely blessed. He's, he's a billionaire, uh, but he has to spend three and a half hours of each day early in the morning making sure and managing all of the aspects of his portfolio with a team of lawyers and certified public accountants. He's, he's filled with anxiety over managing his blessing. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded that the the, the, the noxious fume of anxiety weighs down the heart. Yeah. The, the work of anxiety is to weigh down our hearts and lead us, always leads us into intemperance, overindulgence, and debauchery. Mm. So the very nature of anxiety comes with its own set of blessings. If you can get too much, you can be filled with anxiousness. Wow. Right? Wow. So, uh, it, very much what you said, it's not a negative thing only. It can be, you're, you're so stressed out because you have to purchase a new home with more garage space because you have too many cars in the driveway, Yeah. right? It, it, we're, we're striving for our stuff rather than striving for, for our, our soul. soul. There you go. Uh, there you Hebrews go. 4 said, the only thing the Bible says we should strive for is strive Ooh. to enter into his rest. That's right, that's right. A and, posture of rest. That's right. And so with God's blessing and God's wealth comes peace and the prosperity of the soul. Mm. So that, that world, the kingdom of Jesus Christ is contrasted from the world of our own dominion and our own striving. This world, we try to manage our stuff. Yeah. This world, we relax in our soul. Wow. The, 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 the first part of our life, we're, we're trying to figure out how to get it. Right. Second part, we're trying to figure out how to divest it. That's right. First part's investment. That's second right. Second part's divesting. That's right. And I know this language is not good for America, but a, a life of learning how to lose well. That's right. Is a good life. That's right. That's it's right. It's a good life. Well, you're, you're, you're the young people, uh, especially those of your ilk and kind, are busy gathering. This is that, this, yeah. you're in that gathering stage. You're calling wealth to you. You're calling people. You're calling souls. You're having a great influx and multitudes are being ministered to. You're calling that into your life. But there's also uh, a, another dimension of life and that is you, you, you're, going to, you're going to acquire those things only to give them away. I'm in the season of my life yeah. where I'm investing in you. Yeah. I'm pouring into you. I'm giving myself away because yeah. that's the season of life that I've entered into. Yeah. If you have nothing, if you gathered nothing, mm. you yeah. have nothing to give. Yeah. Right? And so, so many people are filled with anxiety over what they don't have. Never focused on the reality that God wants to give you 
a, an exponential anointing so that you can invest in others. And that's what I love about the Heart Revolution is that you have all of these hundreds of connect groups where people are investing themselves in others. Yeah. And that's the production. That's the injury of wealth and peace, prosperity, and soul rest. Wow. The, the more you serve, giving yourself away, the more God can invest in you. Yeah. That, that, that's, uh, you, you made me think of discipleship. Because, yes. Oh, my God. And a, a picture I got in my mind, even you talking, is... Uh, you know, like a butler yes. who opens the door and he's walking into this beautiful room to take these people to the master's room. That's right. And all of a sudden that butler starts talking to the people and, and they see how he treats them and the hospitable efforts he's making. Yes. And then the butler stops, tells them to wait a minute, runs forward, takes his butler uniform off, puts his Messiah jacket on, That's right. comes back, and brings those people to himself. That's right. Now discipleship is this work. It's, uh, it's ministries burning him. Mm -hmm. Not realizing you forsook the job of a minister, which was to lead these people to intimate That's moments right. with the master. That's right. And somehow in ministry, if we become the master. You become the Messiah. We become the Messiah. Yeah, yeah. We're burnt out and yeah. we're like bad ministry. Yeah. Oh, I don't want to get burnt out in ministry. Yeah. It's not the ministry. Yeah. It's, you forgot, we're creating a place for people to come into intimate moments with Jesus for him to use them, well, not for us to use them. Yeah, and in theology, you know, you, I've taught you this all of your life, but it's called the Messianic complex. Mm. And uh, that is defined in the Old Testament, the Chronicles of the Kings, uh, the, the eulogy of kings. You, you go to the first king of Israel, Saul, he is a typification. He's a typology of a, a, a Saul complex, a Sauling complex, a Messianic complex. Yeah. He was humbled. He was ordained. He was blessed. He was favored. He was given a kingdom. Mm -hmm. But somewhere in the traffic of his life, in the navigation of daily life, he allowed himself to begin to believe in the glitter, in the, in the glitz of his own throne. And he started taking for himself what always belonged to God. Wow. And he ended up cavorting with and talking to spirits of dead, necromancy, spirits of the dead, and inviting words of, of what he hoped would be life, inviting words to be spoken over him from a witch of Endor. Wow. He totally transitioned to angels all because he refused to manage his anxieties under God and he assumed the position that he was his own God. Wow. Right? Wow. And you see him in, in, in the book of Samuel, you see him, uh, in, and in the Kings as well, it refers to him, taking and abrogating the, the, the sacrifice. I'm going, I don't need a priest. I'm going to become my own priest. Mm. Right? He totally allowed anxieties and fears and conspiracy to spoil everything God was doing for him and through him and had called him to and blessed him with in ministry. We cannot get wow. so in, into so much ownership of this thing that we ever stop being the butler, yeah. the we're, leader we're of people to Christ. We're stewards, not owners. Stewards. Wow. The, uh, the, the, the anxiety factor is us wanting to be our own God, mm -hmm. wanting to lead our own life. Yeah, yeah. And I like what you said, anxiety always has a story. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Whether it's true or not. Yes. <laughs> Nehemiah 6, 8, uh, this, this is a good saying for anyone that comes and makes up some stories. It says, everything you're saying, you're making it up in your head. That's right. That's <laughs> None right. of it is true. <laughs> That's right. Everything you're saying, you're making up in your head. Yeah. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Yeah. Paul declared, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. Peter exhorted, cast all your cares upon him. And Jesus again said, don't worry. Don't worry about anything in your life. All of these words that are preached to us from a New Testament, new creation position, a reality that we are to live in, contradict and contravene everything this old man, this old flesh struggles to, to occupy and manage. Mm -hmm. He's telling us, I don't care what circumstances you're involved in, your circumstances should never determine 
the, the disposition of your heart. Wow. You are born to live in the peace of God and in the rest of God. Wow. That's a fabulous word. Yeah. Um, peace, not the kind the world has. That's right. Peace is a process. That's right. And so as we were talking earlier about life being not just an event, but a journey, peace is actually a process as well. That's right. When Jesus is on the boat, the storm starts uh, raging. Jesus comes and says, peace be still to the, the wind and the waves. But he didn't need to tell the waves to be still if he told the wind to be still. That's right. Because the effect of the, uh, the waves was caused by the wind. That's right. So he could have said, wind be still, and then the waves would have. That's right. But he said, peace be still to the wind and the waves so the disciples could begin to experience this inner peace. That's right. There's, there's, a, there's something that should be dropped in. I think a nugget that you've heard me say most of your life is, and I, I think it's appropriate for us to, to remember that during the season of anxiety that we're dealing with. I think, I think we have to go back and remember peacekeeping is vastly different from peacemaking. Yeah, yeah. You, you remember that? Peacekeepers wear blue hats and carry guns with no bullets in them. Mm. They're symbolic of a peace that's already been made. Mm. But the peacemaker is bloody. Yeah. It's a warrior, yeah. right? It's, 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 there, there's great, um, great levels of work and worry and, and death that have happened, mayhem that has taken place. Jesus is our peacemaker yeah. so that we can be peacekeepers. Yeah. We don't have to win our peace. He won it. He's the sacrifice. He's the blood applied on the altar. He's the high priest that officiated over the offering. He is the advocate that pleads for our peace. All we have to do is keep the peace. Peace is not passive. That's right. That's right. And peace is not easy. Because if, if you try to make peace, if you try to make it, not, not realizing what Jesus has accomplished, you, you start defining peace according to your personality. That's right. That's right. And so you think peace and quiet is absence of kids. There you go. There you go. <laughs> or absence of trouble. Or absence of or, trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or having a rest day. I yeah. mean, it's, it, absolutely. When we realize that he made peace for us, mm. he became our peace. Just keep it. He's the propitiation, yes. Don't let the enemy see. So when we traffic through these things, especially going back to what you're talking about, we're processing this, right? It's in the process that we must remind ourselves that though we're in the valley of where anxiety and fears dwell, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because the peace of God is the guardian of my life. Mm. Right? It's amazing. And, and there, we, by rehearsing that, we're stirring up the work that's already done. So peace is for our process. When we're going through the bloody, uh, I call it the bloody um, courtyard of grace. The grace was made where the slaughter was happening. The peace that, were, the peace that was being made was happening on a bloody altar. Yeah. The entrails were being waved and there was blood scattered everywhere and people were covered in blood and worship was going on. It was a very bloody enterprise, but peace was being made with God for Israel. Wow. Well, Jesus did that for us and we have to have that blood applied to us and then know when we're going through the process, no matter how bloody we get, the blood that's being shed around us is through the travail of our circumstances, not the efficacy of our sacrifice. It's once and for all. Wow. Does that make sense to you? That, that makes sense. It's amazing. It's, it's the, 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 the um, stewardship of his sacrifice is in his own hand. Wow. He lords over. He watches over his word that it return not void because he is the sacrifice. All I do is reinforce that and state that with my faith and live through the process, live through the trouble. That's amazing. That's what kept you. That's amazing. That's what keeps me. Yeah. And that's what's going to keep you. Amen. Before we go today, um, I want to say this, this Saturday at 930, we're having an all-in leadership meeting. If you're not a leader and you want to be a leader or if you're not on the team, just come. We'll sign you up that day. Just show up. Actually, don't just show up. Go to heartrevchurch.com, sign up, and then show up. Uh, 930 to 11 Saturday. And then, of course, our service is 9, 11, 1 o'clock in Spanish. This Sunday, we want you to come out. Before we leave, I want Pastor Hutchins to say a blessing and prayer over Heart Revolution Church. 
Lord, in the name of Jesus, thank you for Pastor TJ and the Heart Revolution family. Thank you for the leadership, the elders, the deacons, the trustees, the teachers, the leaders, the feeders. We thank you for every person that is in ministry in the Heart Revolution Church family. We thank you for all of the congregants, congregants that gather there. We thank you for every friend that will be drawn to that place of worship, that holy environment where the old passes and the new is transforming. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit working in every life. We thank you for your guardianship of our life. We thank you for that peace that passes understanding. And we thank you for healing our bodies, our souls, and our minds. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you for heart revolution and San Diego being a lighthouse to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.